Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Johnson for really setting the groundwork here on what I'm going to talk about. And there's a, some overlap, so I'll try to be efficient and trying to uh, where I cross over and not uh, be too repetitive. I was given the daunting task of uh, management of IPF, recent advances in prognosis, comorbidities in clinical trials, uh, positive smorgasbord of material. And so I tried to actually intermix some of it, and you'll see how it actually sits back on a lot of what Dr. Johnson just presented in regards to the diagnosis. Because one of the great limitations that we have in this disease at the moment is that we're really left with a lot of the issues that surround um, clinical outcome measures rather than a biologic marker. And so you'll see that that kind of fits in with how we then determine how people are doing. Just my faculty disclosure in the last year, the companies I've worked with, uh, mostly uh, industry-sponsored trial rather than uh, honoraria for uh, speaking. And so uh, this is uh, an example of my uh, awesome PowerPoint skills. Uh, here's how we thought the decline of IPF uh, was and how it was reported really in the uh, 80s and 90s before uh, reclassification. And the truth is that we've got a series of patients. The patients probably divide into two different groups. We have a series of patients who do kind of obey this purple line uh, where we see them. And over a very short time frame, there's a very rapid decline uh, followed by, unfortunately, mortality. But there's also a very large number of patients that either remain entirely flat or have a very slow and gradual decline. And then finally, a conversion, if you will, of some of those patients into a more rapid course uh, and subsequent mortality. And so the key point there is that the survivorship is really very variable. And that means that we have to concentrate on more than just what the disease is, but how we approach it in general. And trying to figure out how people fall into those two different lines can be a very daunting task. A lot of the things that are commonly looked at are shortness of breath scores, the forced vital capacity or the maximum flow that the lung can generate, the DLCO or the capillary bed measures, the six-minute walk test, how far basically is a comprehensive exercise measure the patient can go. The CT appearance has some corollary. And what's been getting traction in, in uh, the last couple of years is looking at pulmonary hypertension uh, via echo and right heart cath. But at the end of the day, these are really kind of suboptimal. And I'm going to show you a lot of the data for the best that we have at the moment. But really, hopefully, the field will switch into a more of a biomarker kind of approach as the science improves. And it kind of gives you this balance, if you will, between respiratory function and symptoms and predicting outcome. And so this was mentioned by Dr. Johnson, but this is directly pulled from Talmadge's uh, uh, King's paper in 2001 that took a look at the aggregate database that National Jewish had in regards to its uh, large population of IPF patients that they had seen over several decades. And no surprise, this is a disease of the elderly. The rate of IPF is three times higher in an 80-year-old than it is in a 50-year-old. We basically look for it in the 50 to 80-year-old. And so prognosis is directly tied to age as well. Well, gee, that's, you know, I kind of feel like I'm uh, engaging in a bit of a Captain Obvious kind of lecture uh, in the sense that, yes, as we age, we are more at risk of mortality. And this is a direct reflection of that. It's also a direct reflection of probably some of the elements involved in the genetics and the DNA damage that probably predisposes these patients that I'm sure Jim will talk about uh, in his talk. And so this is just a direct presentation of that data that the younger the patient set, the better the survivorship relative to the older patient set. I'm going to skip that one in favor of this one. And so what these are are actually two studies uh, over a decade apart that really show the same thing. Guess what? Not everybody dies of IPF. Everybody dies. I can't stop that, right? We're all mortal. That's going to happen. But how and what we die of varies greatly. And that's true of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis patient as well. It's true that the largest group are going to die of their pulmonary fibrosis, 61%. But that leaves 39% that die of something else. And why am I presenting that at this juncture? Because I'm trying to encompass management and realize that the comorbidities of these patients, which have higher rates and predictability for how the patients are going to do, is directly tied to these other things. And so 
we see that they die of ischemic heart disease, lung cancer, pneumonia, congestive heart failure, and stroke. Many of the things that afflict the elderly already, but some of these afflict IPF patients at higher rates than the same groups of the same age. So this is a nice study that was done by Iraqi a number of years ago in, the, um, in internal medicine that took a direct look at that age-related correlation. So you took two groups that were the same age and basically showed that the IPF patients had a higher rate of death from pneumonia, lung cancer, which has since been borne out by Lejeune and the British healthcare system at an odds ratio of 4.96. That is to say that patients with IPF have a risk of lung cancer that is five times higher than the same patient of the same age without idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And this kind of makes sense if you think about the scarring part of the lung being concerning as a precancerous process. Emphysema, also going to be higher mostly because of the overlap of the high rate of smoking in these patients. Primary TB was not statistically significant. And then PA dilation, or essentially a presentation of pulmonary hypertension. And I'll show you some more data for that. So what are some of the predictors that we have that are proven at this juncture? Well, we basically have static predictors, dynamic predictors that fall into physiologic and serologic categorizations. This was a publication by Talmadge King looking at the GIPF01 data. This was the uh, gamma interferon data in the placebo arm. He took a look uh, to see where we could figure out how the pulmonary function test related back to mortality. And what was interesting was a certain randomness, if you will, in regards to FVC. You can see that the percentage of patients, you know, it's very clear that as the patients uh, had worse FVCs, they didn't do as well in aggregate. But as a percentage, you can see that it's kind of all over the map. And what that means is that those patients that Dr. Johnson showed you earlier with a normal set of pulmonary function tests are still at risk of death. And we know this. They do have this kind of rapid course and can have respiratory failure and die. What it also means is that you can kind of hang around with very low numbers for a long time. Now, one of the other areas that was uh, explored was the look at the AA gradient. And this actually proved kind of difficult to tease out because of the high noise ratio. But nonetheless, you know, the oxygen deficit might be one of the strongest ties for predicting mortality in these patients. And then a direct correlation here with DLCO, which is really a reflection of the same process. The likelihood of your oxygen level being lower if the capillary beds in your lungs are less is going to be higher. And so there seems to be a direct tie in that relationship. So indeed, as you take it from, uh, as you look at it from static and look at it over time, you can see that patients with low DLCOs in both UIP, which would be the IPF correlate, or NSIP, which might be some of the collagen vascular patients, a low DLCO is a predictor of poor survivorship and uh, very pronounced with a p-value of 0.03. And so that's the baseline measure. As we get below critical levels on the capillary beds, we know that the patients start to develop a risk. And this was a nice study by Vil Malama a number of years ago um, that really teases at what is probably a comprehensive look at the function of the lung entirely.